So Amy and I have been doing this podcast for about four years now. And one of the perks of producing this podcast is getting to talk to the most productive and forward-thinking orthos in the industry. And today's no exception. We've got the ultimate Aligner Insider to share his insights and his thoughts about the future of ortho, the latest innovations in Aligner technology, and pretty much anything you want to know. So uh, you don't want to miss this one. Stay tuned. Our Golden Age of Orthodontics podcast sponsors make it possible for us to bring you new episodes. Lightforce Orthodontics is revolutionizing orthodontic care with cutting edge custom bracket technology that offers personalized digital treatment plans that are fast, precise, and uniquely tailored to your patient's needs. Take advantage of the new standard of care with 3D printed fully customized brackets combined with indirect bonding and digital planning. You can learn a lot more and take advantage of some special offers by visiting our partner page at pplpractice.com. The future of orthodontics is evolving and changing every day. But although the way to achieve practice growth has changed, there's never been a better time to be an orthodontist. Let's get into the minds of industry leaders, forward-thinking orthodontists, and technology insiders to learn how they see the future of the orthodontic specialty. How will digital orthodontics, artificial intelligence, clear aligner therapy, remote monitoring, in-house printing, and other innovations change the way you practice? Join your hosts, Dr. Leon Klempner and Amy Epstein, each month as they bring you insights, tips, and guest interviews focused on helping you capitalize on the opportunities for practice growth. And now, welcome to the golden age of orthodontics with the co-founders of People and Practice, Dr. Leon Klempner and Amy Epstein. Welcome to the golden age of orthodontics. I'm Leon Klempner, CEO of People and Practice, a board certified retired orthodontist. I'm the director of ortho at Mount Sinai Hospital here in New York, part-time faculty in the graduate department at Harvard, and the founder of an international nonprofit called the Smile Rescue Fund for Kids. You can learn more about that at smilerescuefund.org. And today, as usual, I'm joined by my daughter and my partner, Amy Epstein. Yep, Amy Klempner Epstein. Um, I'm the COO of People in Practice. I have an MBA in marketing and 20 years of marketing and public relations experience. And my dad and I joined up to provide the tried and true tenets of multinational brand marketing to the orthodontic industry and deployed, obviously, at a hyper-local level. Today, we are thrilled to have Dr. Maz Mashiri with us. Dr. Mashiri has been a faculty member at Align Technology since 2013. He, if you don't know him, he is the co-founder of the Aligner Intensive Fellowship, an online residency that has educated nearly 5,000 orthodontists worldwide on the proper treatment planning and the proper use of clear aligners. Currently, he serves as clinical assistant professor in the orthodontic residency program at the Center for Advanced Dental Education at St. Louis University with a focus on clear aligners. He also serves on the clinical advisory board of orthodontic partners and as an associate editor for the voice of an expert column for the AJODO clinical companion. Dr. Mashiri is a diplomat of the American Board of Orthodontics, as well as a fellow of the American College of Dentists, the International College of Dentists, and the Pierre Fouchard Academy. Dr. Mashiri, Maz, so nice to have you here. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate you having me. All right, Maz. So um, let's start with the fact that... We're no longer in the practice of your father's orthodontists, uh, orthodontic practice, right? Although you are in, in practice with your father. But, but in, in general, things have changed a lot over the years. And um, I'd like to just start with getting your feelings about the current state of clear aligners. Uh, perhaps talk a little bit about uh, the advent of customized digital braces, Lightforce, for example, one of our, our, our podcast sponsors. So everything's moving digitally. Um, so tell me what, what your thoughts about uh, where clear aligners will be, let's say, five years, 10 years. What, what's the, what, what are your thoughts about it? So, you know, um, I've been in practice almost 20 years with my father. Um, and 
when I joined him, we weren't doing any clear liners back then. Uh, all of our brackets were, you know, analog brackets, meaning that we had uh, the same bracket went on every single patient. We had a full-time lab technician that was making all of our appliances in-house. We were putting in separators, placing bands, taking impressions, you know, ma- making everything solder, bringing the patient back in, separators back in. All these things that were in the name of providing patient care, but potentially there was a better way of doing it. And that generally is what happens with time and technology is that we make enhancements or improvements to the way we deliver treatment to our patients. Clear liners was kind of our first foray into that. Uh, for our practice, it was more of we have a very high TMD patient uh, population, and we treat them with removable splints to get them pain-free first. And if they had an indication for detailing their occlusion, to then put those adult patients, primarily adult, into braces was, uh, you know, possible. We did a great job with it, but there seemed like there could be a better way if a clear liner could be effective in doing that. And that was our kind of our foray into that, if you will. But man, we made a lot of mistakes in the beginning and it was not going as predicted. And uh, we had a lot of bumps and bruises in terms of learning how to use the appliance properly. And then eventually got to where now we're very comfortable with it. It's about 50% of what we do in our practice. uh, 50% of our starts are clear liners. And the rest would be, you know, fixed appliances or expanders or things of that nature. Uh, as it pertains to clear liners, for the longest time now, we, of course, have had stereolithic models where you suck down a piece of plastic on and you make that aligner through that manufacturing process. Uh, but again, is that the most efficient way to make an aligner potentially? Uh, with the advent of direct printing, I think that a lot of the companies we're seeing for a, economic reasons, it's probably going to be better for them not to have to make a stereolithic model and just throw it in the trash. But if they can actually direct print the aligner, that's going to really help the economics of manufacturing for them. But at the end of the day, is it in the best interest of the patient again? And that's the big question mark for me. I don't know that yet. Um, but I do believe that all the material science will be invested in trying to get that to eventually get to where that's very feasible. Uh, certain companies like Graphy, for example, are showing shape memory with their aligners. And so that's very intriguing that if that's feasible, do you have to give as many trays to a patient to achieve the same amount of tooth movement, let's say? Uh, being able to direct print an aligner also allows you to vary the thickness of the aligner in defined areas, which changes the biomechanics and can increase stiffness in certain areas, which is, again, very intriguing because that may make the aligners more effective clinically, uh, potentially using less attachments to some extent. And so I think that's the future of clear aligners is uh, potentially direct printing of the aligner and material science, changing the materials of the aligners. Because ultimately, it's just like in fixed appliances, NITI, TMA, steel and steel, we use those at different phases of treatment for different reasons. That may be the case now with clear aligners moving forward. So I think that's extremely exciting to, to, to kind of see the evolution of that. For sure. Do you see in terms, there's material science for sure, but do you see uh, a role for AI and, and machine learning in advancing clear aligner therapy uh, or um, in terms of treatment planning, for example? Uh, I want to say yes, but I've, I've been lecturing for almost 15 years on clear aligners and inevitably you will go and you will go to an audience of, of doctors that will say the sky is falling because AI is going to take over the role of the orthodontist and Invisalign, for example, uh, is doing a lot of machine learning every time we scan we the data and this, that, and the other. And I'm just going to be honest about it. I have not seen a change in the efficacy of an aligner over the past 15 years of the doctors not involved. The doctor, it all begins with diagnosis. And if you don't have the right diagnosis, you're not going to have the right outcome at the end of the day. And the points between A and Z is where the doctor is, still has to be involved. And so uh, I don't think that AI can replace the doctor. And I don't think an AI can diagnose your patient properly or achieve your treatment goals for what you need for that patient, for example. Uh, there's so much nuance that goes into that actually happening right in the beginning to have the final outcome that I just don't see that happening. Now that we're, I do see maybe a uh, facilitation is for potentially choosing the right type of attachments to the, the type of movement we desire. So maybe we set up the treatment plan, move the teeth where we want it to be, build in the overcorrections that at times are needed, which is designing a force system with a digital plan to deliver that to the patient in an appropriate way, and then having the attachments be automated in such a way that supports the movements better. 
maybe that's something I see improving with time. Uh, and that definitely has happened over time. Is it perfect? No, not even close. Uh, but it's getting better and better over time. But uh, not to a point where I think it would, all of a sudden you could submit a case and say, oh, this is going to come back. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to go to my patient. They have a great outcome. That's, I, I don't see that happening for a very, very long time. Uh, unless it's somehow capable of sometime in the future that you can just repeat the pattern of how a doctor over time diagnoses repeatedly on a, on a high angle case, on a class three case, on a, on a deep light case. And there's a pattern there that can be repeated on how the doctor diagnoses. Maybe if that can be learned somehow, but we're talking, I, I mean, my, in my estimate, that's like 20, 30, 40, 50, hundred years from now. I don't see that being anywhere in my career uh, of, of being something that I think I would take advantage of outside of the attachments, I think as an opinion. Yeah. So, you, you know, um, AI is, is a fascinating topic to me. I've been doing a lot of reading about it and thinking about it. And, um, and one of the things that I hear, uh, from some of the orthos on some of the Facebook groups and some of the, you know, my personal discussions with some of them has to do with a fear of large companies, leading brand, for example, um, uh, housing so much data that at some point in time, that data could be utilized in a way that can, in, in the best scenario, help orthodontists in terms of choosing uh, a treatment plan. For example, uh, let's say you submit uh, a treatment plan and, and you get back a, uh, we'll use Invisalign as an example, a clean check. And, and then there might be a ability to push a button and have the AI tell you that you, based on the data, you have a 75% chance of success. However, if you make these changes, you will have a 92% chance of success. Do you see that in the realm of, of possibilities moving down the road? I think that there's so much that happens. The answer is potentially, but I think there's so much that happens between the aligner delivery and the finish that uh, that data is not seen that uh, facilitate what it actually takes to finish a case. So for example, it could be elastics could be an example of that, that we could predict that we're going to have rubber bands in this case and we end up, maybe we don't use them or we have other cases where we didn't predict we needed rubber bands, but we ended up using them and we ended up modifying the tray to get the outcome we needed clinically. Um, and so there's still enough nuance between those variables that I feel like anything like that, like guardrails or, you know, uh, you know, helping hands to help direct decisions may be useful. At the end of the day, nothing replaces experience from the doctor's perspective. Um, and so, you know, I know for like a new grad coming out where you just don't know at that point, you know, you know enough to be dangerous, you're still trying to figure everything out that maybe it would be useful for uh, that type of a clinician to some extent, or somebody who is an experienced doctor would say that once all of a sudden start doing aligners later in their career, to maybe guide them in a certain direction. But on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't see that really um, providing me much benefit, for example. Because uh, I feel like my experience is what lends me the most benefit versus having those type of tools available to me at the, at, at the moment, at the moment. The one thing that as we're talking about this, that maybe could give better guidance potentially is integration of CBCT into these technologies, which is starting to happen. And I think the better and better that gets in terms of actually knowing, because sometimes you see the roots go through the cortical bone and you're like, is that really happening or can that even really happen? Because there's so much cortical bone resistance. Now, what the software is predicting may not be a reality, but as that data aggregates over time, then potentially that gives us better guardrails as to actually not moving teeth where they shouldn't go. I think that will give us really a, a very powerful benefit long term in terms of seeing things we weren't seeing before or that we were, I, lack of a better word, ignoring before, you know, and not understanding we we're kind of like, you know, uh, blind eye to it. Uh, getting a good clinical outcome, but where were the roots at, at some point in the belt, you know, until you flap the patient, you don't really see it. If they're symptomatic, you wouldn't know it, let's say. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, new graduates coming out and, and, um, I was just curious because I know that, um, that you, you are involved at the, in the residency program at SLU and, and I'm involved at Harvard 
And um, I'm, I'm interested in your uh, perspective in terms of preparing our residents for the real world when, when they get out. And are you doing anything differently or, or how are you preparing residents to effectively use clear aligners? Because, you know, you, you, we all know the demand is there and, and the reality uh, is that they're going to need to be addressing this issue. But from an educational standpoint, um, what, what do you, what do you, th what, what, what are you doing at SLU? Is, I guess, my question in terms of preparing residents. So, my angle on that is I've always thought that somebody could not be successful at clear line of therapy unless they were honestly successful at using fixed appliances. Because there is uh, an analogous uh, comprehension or thought process that needs to occur with regards to not only diagnosis because that's so important, uh, but also biomechanics to some extent as well. Uh, for example, um, you know, going to the treat course uh, when I was a resident was one of the most important weeks of my life uh, because of the understanding of uh, forces that happens with tip back bends or anchorage control, vertical control, things of that nature that need to be applied to fixed appliances, but then also then apply analogously to clear aligners as well and understanding equal and opposite forces and designing attachments and so forth. Um, and so I really try to, when I teach clear aligners, go through the approach through a diagnostic process and a biomechanic process. And I just talk about the bells and whistles of any system. The bells and whistles don't matter. What matters is the actual fundamental diagnosis and the fundamental biomechanics. And if you understand those things, you can manipulate almost any aligner system to do what you need to do. And the bells and whistles will just hopefully make you a more efficient clinician to some extent because they hopefully help you to delegate certain things that you're having to think through or do on your own uh, at some point in time. Uh, but, you know, for example, I use Invisalign. I'm a speaker for them and I get compensated as a speaker for them. But I also use ULAD in my office to make in-house aligners. I get zero compensation from them. And the two can be further apart as far as I'm concerned in terms of like kind of what they offer in terms of tools, but I use them both because it's in the benefit of my patient. And to be able to do that, though, takes an acumen of understanding diagnosis and, you know, uh, appropriate treatment and attachments. And so that's really what I focus on with the residents is trying to go bare bones basics, but it all starts with diagnosis and all starts with really biomechanics. I try to draw analogies between fixed appliances all the time when I'm lecturing, saying like, I'm going to, bend in a reverse curve of speed in the ClinCheck. I don't expect that this is going to look like this in the patient's mouth. I do this in fixed appliances in this situation. I'm doing it with the aligner in this situation. And so I always try to go back and forth between fixed appliances and aligners because I think that's how you really bridge the gap there for learning because it's not, I'm not an Invisalignist. You know, I'm an orthodontist. And so having the, uh, having the acumen to understand going through those different appliances because there's tools for us is very important and not to think that they can go on and have a 99% Invisalign practice. They're going to be a great orthodontist. Like you, you could do that potentially, but you're in you know, some situations where you need braces, you know, so you're going to have to really understand how to go between both appliances and what you're using. So, so uh, just as a quick follow up uh, at my own curiosity is that I don't know many people that have more experience using aligners than, than you do or Jonathan does. Uh, so I'm curious, like, what is your criteria for moving to fixed appliances? Like, what, what is your limit in terms of what you're going to treat with aligners uh, before you, you consider using brackets? My main um, kind of hurdle or handcuff, if you will, is uh, the vertical dimension in terms of if I have a very brachycephalic deep bite patient where there's no growth remaining and minimal crowding. Because if I don't have enough crowding, I can't propine the teeth to open the bite. And I'm really depending on just pure intrusion to open the bite. Uh, and those are really probably the most challenging cases for a clear liner to deal with. Uh, extraction cases that have minimal crowding can also be quite challenging because there's a significant amount of space closure involved if there's minimal crowding. So like a bimax protrusive type case. Um, again, that's probably a little bit easier than a deep bite patient I just gave you, but it's just... Why would I want to do it is almost the question because I know it's going to take more time. When I can do it with braces and get a, a potentially equal or better outcome in a less amount of time, 
in that extraction example, why, why would I want to put the patient through that? And just you know, it burn them out because the aspect of clear line treatment, just like with fixed appliances, with probably more grounds to psychology. How long is that patient into your treatment? How long do you have them engaged in your treatment? You know, I feel like it's going to take longer than eighteen months with a clear liner. Then I'm probably talking them into braces at that point because at that you know I have more control over the case. You know, and with uh, braces, it, it, it potentially could take. 18 months as well, or maybe a little bit longer, but I just feel like I'm not going to lose that patient as easily as if psychologically with a clear liner. Torque is another one. If someone's like a class two, diff two, again, they treat decently well, potentially, because that is it really torque or proclination you're getting in terms of what you're seeing clinically, but it just takes a longer time to express. It could take up to two years again to treat that class two, diff two type patient. And so what I rather just get it over with, with a fixed appliance for them. So that's really where that decision comes into play is, Clinical quality of outcome, you know, efficacy of movement and treatment time uh, are really kind of where I kind of draw the line there. And it's mainly deep overbites, minimal crowding, extraction cases that have minimal crowding or uh, patients with significant torque needs are the other type of cases where I try to steer away from. So let me jump in and ask a non-clinical question because I'm the non-clinical one here. Um, and it, you know, in your bio that, that we talked about in the beginning of the show, the uh, orthodontic partners, you sit on their clinical advisory board. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, what are your thoughts on how um, OSOs and organizations like orthodontic partners are going to be impacting the future of orthodontics? And I say that knowing that you know we're seeing how it's impacting the future of orthodontics, but it's really um, on the ground, at least with our clients, we get sort of mixed feedback. It ebbs, it flows. You know, there's um, some that love the model and some that hate the model. And if you go to the AO and you listen to the lectures, there's some that love the model, some that hate the model. And um, so, I and in terms of where you see from this point forward, um, OSO is impacting the future of orthodontics. Talk to me about your perspective there. I think it's very important that. We look at it pragmatically and understand that there's no perfect solution, meaning that you're going to find people in private practice that love it. You're going to find people in private practice that also hate it. And it's going to be the same with an OSO model. And that's just the way life is. I mean, there's not going to be anything that really is, you know, perfect, you know, unless it's like a bowl of like, you know, salted caramel Oreo ice cream. Maybe that's like perfect. But, you know, it, it, as, it, as far as it goes in many things, there's going to be pluses and minuses to it. So, um, with the OSO model, what I'm seeing is for practices like myself, why did we choose to do that? We got to a scale in terms of our practice got big enough where we were having problems managing our practice. And so I wanted to have outside help. I knew my dad was going to retire and he slowed down. I knew my sister was going to uh, get pregnant, have children, which she has, and that, you know, she has a growing family. So she was going to be here less. And I just needed help to run this business. And to have someone come buy it from me, I could have also done that. But to have a resident class school and take out an X million dollar loan, have a bank approve that when they have X hundred thousand dollars in debt is going to be less and less feasible. Uh, and so for us, that was our solution to help manage and bridge that gap. Now I am bringing on an associate in January, which I'm thrilled about, who's a, a kiddo and I call him a kid, he's almost 30 that I treated as my ABO board patient 15 years ago. Uh, and so he's come full circle to joining us now, but now I can have him on a pathway to partnership within the OSO. That's much more reasonable for him in terms of he can still have a buy-in, but it's not X million dollars of, you know, loan ladies take out. And I can also grant him equity. So he has equity in the business. And that's a model for him to be able to get into a practice, get his experience. And if he enjoys being or God willing, that he wants to be an owner of this practice, meaning you have shares of the company. You can't have wealth in America unless you own something, ultimately. You know, I think that's the that's the disparity what we see within OSOs is that you become a, a, a full-time associate. And some docs, you know, may want that. They may, you know, this new generation of doctors, they may want to work three days a week and not have the responsibilities of ownership. And they may just want to get, you know, a $300,000 salary, for example. Uh, and, Call it, call it a great day, right? And not have to take any of the stress at home with them. Others may want more, you know, but are they going to want to take the risk of starting a business or buying a practice? Because that's really hard to do as well. 
And so there's a place for that for the new docs coming out. And so how that shapes things, my concern with the shaping of it, where I see the biggest issue, is if there's a doctor that is in their 50s or 60s that wants to use the OSO to hang it up, but they're not putting in the proper diligence to apprentice somebody to take over their practice and to carry on the quality of care. And that's what concerns me the most. And so I think it's important that the group you join, if you decide to do that, if you're looking into that, and if it matters to you, which it should, has a pathway for that to happen for a proper handoff and that the groups out there aren't the type that are just accepting people that want to go to the beach the next year because that's where the current quality of care everything falls apart. And so, uh, selfishly speaking, again, I'm part with our partners, but that's what drew me to their model is that it's younger doctors that join. If you look at some of the doctors there, they're not in their 60s and 70s. We're younger doctors that have like a 10, 15 year career ahead of us at least that we want to have a proper handoff and training of people. So, for example, my associate coming in, that's what drew me to that model uh, is, is to help me in my practice, but yet had a pathway for me to eventually transition to practice down in a responsible way because my name's on the door still. It's my sure orthodontics. It's my father's legacy. It means a lot to me that that's done in the right way. We have a good name in our community. I don't want that to fall to shambles. You know, So like those things are where I get concerned about OSOs because, again, there's no perfect solution. I know there's good OSOs and there's going to be bad OSOs. And obviously there's money involved. And so that clouds things at all times. And so there has to be a good CEO on board. There has to be good integrity, good values for the group. And that just takes a lot of trust and ability to understand what you're getting into. Yep. Well, that all makes sense. And as we learn uh, more and more about the OSOs out there and the different needs of the de- our client base has are going through transitions all the time. And so uh, it's good to have that perspective and be able to pass it along to our clients. Yeah. And my, 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 my biggest concern is that patient base and what happens long term and that hopefully the doctors just want to hang it up. I think that's where I get concerned about the whole model. Yeah. Yeah. The institutional knowledge goes away and then then what? So Exactly. Uh, It has been a pleasure talking to you, Maz. Thank you so much for joining us today. If our listeners would like to learn more about what you do, learn more about the Aligner Intensive Fellowship or um, Orthodontic Partners or anything, how might they be able to get in touch with you? So uh, my email address is Moshiri Maz, M-O-S-H-I-R-I-M-A-Z at gmail.com. That's my personal email address. And I welcome people to always email me personally. I'm, I'm, I'm neurotic. On my email, I tend to keep 20 in my box at all times. If it gets more than that, I get frantic about it. Ooh, so I, I my inbox would day. make you go crazy. <laughs> my inbox would <laughs> would send you to an asylum. <laughs> it's, a good, it's, a, it's a good and a bad thing. My wife gets on me like, always checking your emails. Like, I can't put things to rest. I have to take care of them and put them as or, or like categorize them into a different folder, but yes, I'm yes. I care about it. But no, yeah, that, you know me. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's the advice. That's the best practice. That is the way to do it. <laughs> I have to right. say that's mine right. is not that way. It's not easy, I'll tell you. It's not so, easy. But no, I appreciate the opportunity to be honored to, to meet you both uh, via this format. I look forward to seeing it some of the meetings upcoming. So thank you. Sounds good. Thanks yeah. a lot. I appreciate it. Thank you. You can subscribe or download other episodes of the Golden Age of Orthodontics on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, if you want to see us, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you enjoyed it, we'd appreciate you telling a colleague. For more information about people in practice, you can visit our website at pplpractice.com. And if you'd like to reach me, you can reach me at leon at pplpractice.com. Um, I have... Uh, gone through my inbox and try to keep it tight. <laughs> I use a, an app called, uh, what's it called? Sanebox? Sanebox. Sane Sanebox, yeah, yeah, Sane yeah, yeah, yeah. which, which is, is useful. But anyway, um, if you're looking for um, a deal on customized brackets, uh, Lightforce is sponsoring this podcast and you can go to our partner page at pplpractice.com for more information there. Um, If you want to learn more about aligners, you got to contact Moz. I don't think there's anybody more suitable to help you along that path. And remember that for forward-thinking orthodontists, it really has never been a better time to be an orthodontist. We're in the golden age. Take advantage of it. So long for now. 
Thank you for tuning in to the Golden Age of Orthodontics. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or visit our website at thegoldenageoforthodontics.com for direct links to both the audio and video versions of this episode.